Hi everyone! In this video we're going to talk about integrals of vector functions. So let me remind you what a vector function looks like. So I have it written as r of t. So r is this vector function where your input is t and you have these component functions that describe some relationship with t that's going to give you some numbers in the i, j, and k direction. Okay, and then when you put all that together, you get a point in space, and then your vector goes from the origin to that point. So that's your vector function. So just now, let's do some integration with it. And so we have indefinite and definite integrals. So let's start with indefinite. So indefinite integral, and we have the following. So we're going to say of r of t, and this is with respect to t. So with respect to t. So we have our integral symbol of r of t, little r, dt. So we're integrating with respect to our input t. And this just equals capital R of t plus c. Okay? Very much the same integration you did with scalar-valued functions. You're now doing it with vector-valued functions. And so just to be very distinct here, this is where capital R is the antiderivative of little r, our vector function. Antiderivative of little r. And then c is a constant. So the only real difference here from scalar valued functions is that everything's a vector. So you integrate a vector valued function, you get another vector plus a constant vector, or a vector function plus a constant vector. So next is our definite integral. So definite integral, and we have the following. So first I just want to say if the component functions, something about them. So if the component functions and real quick, the component functions are these functions that give you the values for i, j, and k. So the component functions are f, g, and h for how I wrote it. If the component functions of r are integrable, integrable, meaning you can integrate them. You can integrate each one of these. So if they're integrable, on some interval, I'm going to say the interval goes from A to B. So if all of that is true, then we have the following. It is a definite integral, so notice we're going to have limits of integration. So integrate from A to B. And our integral of R of T, DT, just equals, we're going to say the individual integrals of the component functions. So the integral from A to be of f of t dt. And then that's going to be for i. So let me sque squeeze i in here. I know I kind of ran out of room. But this is still going to produce a vector. So notice the same thing here. This was a vector. Just my notation here. But when we integrate this vector function with the definite integral, it still produces a vector. So this part's a scalar. This is a number. But then put i, because that's the i component of our vector and then plus the integral from a to b of g of t dt and that's going to be the j component and of course you can see where this is going the last part is the integral from a to b of h h of t dt and squeeze k in there right, right there in the back okay so very similar to what you know about integrals of scalar valued functions now, I'm going to mention the fundamental theorem of calculus, but for vector functions. So let's go ahead and get rid of this indefinite integral side. So we have our fundamental theorem, and this is of calculus, but for continuous vector functions. So of calculus for continuous vector functions. 
All right, so it just says the following. And if you remember your fundamental theorem of calculus for continuous scalar functions, very much similar to what you're about to see. So the integral from a to b of r of t dt, and if we use our same notation that we had for our indefinite integral, I was using capital R. This just equals the antiderivative capital R evaluated at B minus the antiderivative evaluated at A. Same fundamental theorem of calculus that you knew from the past, but this time it's just for vector functions. All right, now let me give you a note here. So note the indefinite integral is going to give you a vector valued function vector valued function but think about this definite integral you actually just get a single constant vector so definite integral implies a single constant vector. Alright, so just real quick, the difference between these two. If you don't have limits of integration that you're plugging in, then your result is a vector valued function where you can you have a function where you can input t values. It's, it's a definite integral, you plugged in values for t, and this is going to give you still a vector, but a single vector, a single constant vector, not a vector function. So just a slight difference there. Okay, let's go through an example. So I'm going to talk about an acceleration vector, and we'll work out an example with that. All right, so here's this example. The acceleration vector of a hang glider is given here. So a of t, that's the acceleration vector, is negative 3 cosine ti minus 3 sine tj plus 2k. Then it is initially departed from this point in space. 4, 0, 0. So the hang glider takes off from the basically 4 in the x direction but 0 in the y and z. And its initial velocity is 3j. Okay? Find the glider's position as a function of time. Alright, let's break this down. Look at what you're asked for, position, and look at what you're given, acceleration. So you have to figure out how do I go from what I'm given to what I'm asked for? And so we've talked about this. If you recall, the acceleration of, of our acceleration function, if this is an acceleration of this hang glider, it's actually the second derivative of position. So this is the second derivative of position, which we've been using r with respect to t. Okay. So position, dif differentiate it twice and you get acceleration. It's also the first derivative of velocity. So if you want to say it like this, you can say that this is the first derivative of the velocity. Okay, because remember, position, when you differentiate it, you get velocity. When you differentiate velocity, you get acceleration. So we have to go backwards, basically, or integrate. So we're trying to get to r position, so we're going to integrate twice. All right, and along the way, we have to use our values that are given. Okay, so let's start by jumping right into our integration. We're going to integrate our acceleration vector with respect to t. And it's this vector here, so I'm just going to go right into what it equals when I start integrating. And remember, you can, just like with derivatives, you can integrate and differentiate the component functions. So we're going to integrate this component function. So antiderivative of cosine t is sine t. So this is negative 3 sine t, and that's still in the i direction. That's this part here. Antiderivative of sine t is negative cosine t. So this is going to be minus negative 3 cosine t in the j direction. And then last, the integral of this constant 2 is just 2t, so 2tk. Now, don't forget, there was no limits of integration. We weren't given information about that, so we actually have plus c. 
I'm going to go ahead and call it C1, okay, because we're going to integrate again. I'll call that C2. So I have my antiderivative plus a constant because it was an indefinite integral. Now, so since we did that, well, what do I do with all this other information I was given? I know that we initially departed from this position. Okay. I also know that the velocity was here. Well, what can I use to figure out maybe possibly what this constant is? Because I am still going to have to integrate again. So this antiderivative of acceleration is just your velocity function. Okay? So because the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So when we integrated, we got velocity. So we know the velocity initially is just should equal 3j. So we know when we plug in, think about it really quick, initial t values. If this t input represents time, initial time would be when you start the clock. So time is zero. So that means initially you have zero for t. So we're going to plug in zero for t into this velocity function. So we have negative 3 sine of 0. Uh, this turns into a plus 3 cosine of 0. That's j. And then plus 2 times 0k plus c1. All right, and we know also when initially time is 0, the velocity was 3j. OK, so we just solved this equation. Everything is a value here other than C1 that we know. So we just solve for the unknown, C1. So sine of 0 is 0. Okay, so that's 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So that's 3 times 1. So this is 1j. 2 times 0 is 0. And then we have plus C1 here. All right, and it should equal 3j. So we know that, let me um, kind of give us some room. Let's move up here really quick. So we know from down here that 0 plus 1j plus 0 plus c1 equals 3j. So 1j plus c1 equals 3j. So if we solve for c1, we get subtraction c1 equals, actually this was not a 1, this was a 3, so that was 3 back here. It was cosine of 0 was 1, but times the 3. So 3j plus c1 equals 3j. So if you subtract 3j from both sides, c1 is 0. OK, so our velocity function is just these three components plus 0. We just found this constant. So now that's integrating once. We're going to integrate twice, so one more time. So I just need to remember my initial point, initial position. So I'm going to keep that in mind, 4 comma 0 comma 0. So let's give us some more room and keep going. So we integrated once. Let's do this one more time. So now we are going to integrate velocity. And this is our function here. Let me just kind of make it very clear. This is what we're integrating because this was a 0. If this wasn't 0, we wouldn't include it. Technically, we are including it, but it's 0. So then I'm going to start integrating the components. So antiderivative of sine, this is going to be negative 3 times negative cosine t, that's for i, over here. Let's go ahead and just turn that into a plus. So plus 3, antiderivative of cosine is sine t, and that's for j. And then antiderivative of 2t, that's going to be 2t squared over 2, k. Okay. And you can divide out those 2s. But it's still an indefinite integral, so plus a constant. I'm going to call it c2. OK, so this one here, let's just go ahead and say that that's t squared k. All right, so we, we have now integrated twice. So technically, this is our position function. Okay, this is our position vector function. But I can't leave that constant in my answer because I've been given enough initial conditions to find that value. So now I know that when time starts with this hang glider falling, that this was t equals 0. So if I plug in 0 for t here, I'm able to solve for the second constant, c2. So I'm going to say this is positive 3 cosine of 0 
i. And then that's positive 3 sine of 0 j. Over here, this is going to be t squared or 0 squared k, and then plus c2. Okay. Now, what does that equal? Well, we know the initial position had a point. So if I represent that as a vector in ijk form, like I had here, so you can put the angle bracket form, but I'm going to just be consistent since I'm using i, j, and k. That point, if you write it as a vector from the origin to that point, it's zero, uh, it was 4 um, i plus 0 j plus 0 k. All right, and then we just solve this equation. So let's go ahead and move this part right here and simplify. So we have, this is 1 times 3, so this is 3i. This is 0 times 3, so it's 0j, and this is 0k, plus c2, this constant vector, and it should equal 4i plus 0j plus 0k. Okay, so 3, 3i plus c2 equals 4i, and then we solve for c2. So let me move this velocity vector. And we get, if we solve for C2, that C2, this constant vector, is just going to be 1i. All right, and now we can put that all together because technically we had our answer for position back here, but we had a constant. So we're going to put all this together with what that constant vector was. So final answer, our position of our hang glider can be represented by this vector function where we have positive 3 cosine t i, but notice our constant vector in the back is also going to be an i. So just to save some writing, I'm going to say this i, and instead of writing it at the end, plus this i, because this was one i, this one i component, let's put them together. So I actually go like this, plus 1, and that's the i component. Just putting these two together, and then plus 3 sine t for j, and then plus t squared k. And that is our position vector. And if you want to make sure you did it right, you can just differentiate it twice, and you'll get back to the acceleration vector that we were given at the beginning. Okay, so we're going to stop on this one. Um, in the very next video, we'll talk about projectile motion. So see you soon.